The Australian Defence Force is by far the largest military force in Oceania, with over 85,000 full-time personnel and a very interesting foreign language training program where they learn like this. But the ADF needs to learn languages because they are surrounded by islands where tons of different languages are spoken and they need to get involved in cultural activities. And let's not forget one particular job for linguists that is so top secret that nobody actually knows what they do all day. It is time for a deep dive into language training in the Australian military. The army needs linguists to communicate with local populations. If they speak the languages, they can build trust, do humanitarian work, even rescue people. He says he misses his home, his mum, his dad, and he is fine being here with us. Of course, you can help people without speaking their language, but things are going to go a lot smoother if you can. And of course, they are soldiers, so it's not just the local languages that they need to know. If you are deployed to Afghanistan and have learned to speak Dari, only to discover that the people you'll be helping all speak Pashto, well, you may have a communication problem. In fact, in conflict zones, even understanding graffiti on a wall can be critical to survival because it can tell you if you've wandered into a hostile environment, which could, of course, cause you a few problems. So we're going to find out all the languages it's possible to learn in the Australian military, how they learn them and how they use them. And there's one job coming up where you can't just get by on the basics. You need to be insanely good. Now, let's just remember one important thing about languages. There is the technical capability, that's the language skills, and then the people capability, and that's the cultural skills. The two go hand in hand. In the military, this can determine your success or failure. Well, language barriers are a challenge uh, between any partner force, you know, even between Australia and uh, America. The Defence Force School of Languages is located at RAF Williams in Melbourne, Australia. It's an Air Force base and if you fly over you'll see an airplane shaped building and this is where Australian military linguists go to learn languages. It's known around the world as a state-of-the-art military language training facility. They teach language and cultural training in what they call languages other than English or L-O-T-E. In fact, they're a Western world leader in the instruction of one particular type of language. Not everyone gets language training though, you need to have a good reason for it, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. But first, where did it all begin? Well, the first language ever taught here was Japanese, way back in July 1944, when they were still called the Royal Australian Air Force School of Languages. It started off as a desperate way to train interpreters right after the war, and soldiers learned written and spoken Japanese. The intense training of up to eight hours a day caused so much stress that they called it Japan brain, and a few students even committed suicide. Gradually, more languages were introduced as needed. First Russian, Mandarin, Indonesian, and Thai, then Vietnamese, French, Burmese, Arabic, and German. And then in 1990, they also added Khmer and more recently, Persian. On the 1st of February 1993, the school was renamed the Australian Defence Force School of Languages, although it's still administered by the Air Force. So do recruits still get Japan brain? Keep watching to find out. They call it ADF Langs. That's a friendly nickname for the school. So we are off to a good start. It offers 18 languages in 53 different courses, but languages vary year by year depending on what's needed. The school says these courses are unique, grueling, and intensive. Tell you what, I'll let you decide if that's true or not. So here is one surprising thing that they do differently there. Language training doesn't happen at the same time as combat training. No. In fact, you complete your military training first and only attend the language school afterwards. It's a separate thing. You may well be there for a whole year just learning languages, nothing else. Sounds like fun. Once you're in, housing is set up, and if you have a family, you'll stay together with them. Otherwise, you can be on campus with the other students. And then it all begins. What exactly are you being trained for here? What job? So not everyone has to learn a foreign language, but you can apply if you want to. And why would you want to? Well, apart from learning the languages of your neighbours, which would make you totally awesome, you might be hoping to get into some sort of international engagement role, in which case it's a pretty smart career move. But here's one thing, while any member of the Army or Air Force can apply to learn a language, not everyone in the Navy can. In the Navy, you have to either be an officer who might be posted into an attaché role, that means going on an overseas mission with a diplomat, or you need to have the one job for which languages are completely essential. The work that we do is, is very important to the security of Australia. 
Initially, when you join up, it is a bit of a culture shock, coming into an environment where yeah, everything is on a, a need-to-know basis. You, you literally you just cannot talk shop at home. You may get the opportunity to uh, be trained in another language. Traditionally, you'd be looking at uh, either Asian or probably Middle Eastern languages. Cryptologic linguist sounds really exciting. It's an intelligence job. You'll spend your days listening, intercepting, analyzing, and translating foreign languages using very high-tech equipment. Now, any guesses which language you think is compulsory for these guys? Which language do you think they have to study? Put your guesses in the comments. As far as I can tell, this is the only job for which a language test is also compulsory in recruiting. And if tests make you nervous, well, you ain't seen nothing yet. I will start you off easy though. First test, here we go. You see those little like and subscribe buttons? Go ahead, see if you can click them. Second test, turn on the notification bell. You see, that wasn't too bad, was it? A star for you. Australian military uses the Modern Language Aptitudes Test, or MLAT. It is designed to predict success in learning a foreign language, and it's an extremely difficult test that most people fail. Many past students say that they highly recommend that you study and probably not show up for the test with zero language knowledge. But luckily, there is a practice website that you can go to with practice questions. Isn't that nice? There are over 500 simulated test questions, as well as 19 audio exercises that mimic the test, but it ain't free. The MLAT consists of five sections. Each section measures a particular skill for learning a language. So, how good is your memory, soldiers? In the memory test, you get two minutes to memorize a set of 24 made up words and their meanings in English. And then you have to answer multiple choice questions about those meanings. There are five possible scores that you can get. There is fail, and then it goes by level, one, two, three, or four, with four being the highest. If you score a level one, it means they'll only let you study an easier language. If you score level two, but really want to do a level three language, you might be allowed onto the course. So basically your score determines what languages are open to you. If you fail the MLAT, you can still learn a language on your own, and many soldiers do. Why? Because they're allowed to get tested later at the school. So they study with language apps on their phone or whatever else that they can find and try to get their level up to scratch. But since we're talking about mastering a language, this is a pretty good time to tell you briefly about a very exciting upcoming event here at Story Learning, which is we are finally releasing our new intermediate language courses to the public. At Story Learning, we teach languages through the power of stories. A little bit like the story you're listening to right now. You see the connection? Stories help you learn faster. We've had tens of thousands of students learn a new language with our story learning programs over the years, but we are finally now releasing our programs for intermediate level students to help you keep learning and move towards the advanced levels. I am honestly totally buzzing to be releasing these courses finally. And we have at the intermediate level, Spanish, Italian, French, German, and Japanese. All of course with brand new stories, new curricula, some incredible teachers. It is really, really exciting. So for more information on these intermediate programs, there's a link down below in the description. Check it out. And now back down under. But did you guess which language is compulsory for that intelligence job? It is Indonesian. Yes, a six month Indonesian course is part of their initial training. But aside from these guys, who typically applies to do a language? Priority languages for East Asia and Southeast Asia are taught every year. These are Arabic, Farsi, and Dari. And common languages learned among reserve forces are Cantonese, Mandarin, Hindi, and Spanish. By the way, one of these languages seems to be in huge demand. And I keep reading that there aren't enough Mandarin Chinese linguists, and it has something to do with the military selection process. Thing is, they're not exactly making it easy to get onto a course. Remember that MLAT story? Yeah. Anyway, the language courses run from late January to early December. Some are long, some are short. And just like at the Defense Language Institute, DLI in the US, the more difficult the language, the more time you get to learn it. They break the courses down into groups. Check this out, it's interesting to see. Strategic engagement courses are 46 weeks, and these languages are Chinese, Indonesian, Japanese, and Thai. Joint tactical interaction courses are five, eight, or 10 weeks, and you can learn Arabic, French, Indonesian, Malay, Pashto, Dari, Tatum, and Tok Pisin. Haven't heard of that last one? It is spoken in Papua New Guinea. It's an official language. Fun fact, Papua New Guinea has the most spoken languages in the world, 850 of them. Yeah. Now what's next? Operational engagement courses. Those are 36 or 38 weeks. That's all of these. There are also basic language and general language courses, military communication skills courses, which are 22 weeks long, and some specialist courses for trades and refresher courses. Whew. But what about languages from other islands? My name is Alessi Christopher Tamati. I'm a proud Samoan and a Mare Island and Saibai warrior. Diversity and multiculturalism in the Air Force is extremely important. Look around, everyone's from somewhere. Samoan native speakers in the Australian army, that is pretty awesome. What about Australian indigenous languages? Despite 
significant contribution and sacrifice from our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, we still have subjected them to prejudice and discrimination. Now that's occurred in the past and it's our opportunity to make sure that does not continue. The Share Your Heritage campaign is a really uh, important way of us demonstrating our commitment to our future force. It's an opportunity to showcase the rich layers of diversity that we have within Air Force. That is very, very cool and very important as well, learning about the languages and cultures of your own backyard as well as part of your training. These guys are obviously a huge asset to the force. But speaking of diversity, the Air Force even has some polyglots. And if you stood all the Air Force members' languages in a row, there would be 72 of them. There is a whole range of people who could end up on a language course. It's an interesting mix. They even have musicians from the army band doing these courses. Depending on the language, there might only be three or four in the class. And inside the classroom, well, there's no rank. You are all students. You're all equal. So take a listen to this study schedule here and tell me how long you think you might last. So each week, trainees get two topics that they'll go through. They start off with simple things like greetings and clothing. Monday and Tuesday is topic one. Wednesday and Thursday is topic two. So from Monday, from eight till 10, the instructor goes through new vocabulary, which is about 30 words. Wednesday then is exactly the same with different words. They take the time to explain the meaning of the words. There's a lot of pronunciation practice. And then from 10 to 11 a.m., well, that's for listening. They listen to the 30 words for first just for meaning and then again in context with short sentences. From 11 till 12 till midday, they switch to grammar, putting those words into sentence structures and learning different elements of grammar and then applying it with the new vocabulary. Then it's time of course for lunch from 12 till one and then from one till two, there is speaking practice in small groups. They might use the list of new vocabulary and short sentences and cut those up, try to translate them. Sounds like fun, right? Tuesday and Thursday start off just the way we all like to begin our own Tuesdays, Thursdays at home, with revision and homework checking. Am I right? 10 till 11 a.m. was another listening activity. And after that, they had interactive speaking in groups with lots of translating as opposed to freer speaking. After lunch, they had something very useful, which is a one-on-one -on -one speaking session with the instructor for about 15 minutes each. This one-on-one -on -one speaking is excellent language practice, guaranteed to keep the language blues at bay. There is something missing here, I think, and if you know me by now, you can probably guess what that might be. Any guesses in the comments. Friday is a formative assessment just to see how you're getting on. Those all sound very thorough, I will give them that. There is something that the school does really well though, and that is working culture into every single topic that they tackle. After all of that, how many weeks does this intensive training last? The year is broken down into segments focusing on different things. The first 15 weeks were basic fundamental. The rest of the year is for other things. So next they go into a military specific phase for three weeks. This means learning military vocabulary. So the ranks, the equipment, the military phrasing and so on. Let's see, now they've done a total of 33 weeks of language training, sticking to a strict repetitive daily routine. That is pretty intense, but hold up. Something is wrong here. Where are all the, where's all the push-ups and the, the punishments? Okay, okay, I cannot promise you push-ups, but I can give you this. Ita hatene ingles. Lai, hakulia tetun date. What's this, you ask? Well, it is a virtual environment language simulator, of course. Here's what I found out. First, you choose your mode. Beginner, intermediate, or advanced. You're then given a brief and your objectives. In this case, you have to greet a group of Timorese people. You record yourself when it's your turn to speak, and the avatar answers you. So there are instructions like tell him to go around and then you have to say that in a sentence in Timorese. So as you can see here, there's a transcript of what you're saying that appears as you speak. You get a score and you can repeat the same conversation to improve. So what do you guys at home think of this? If, if you were in the ADF language school recently, did you get to try this? There are regular fun events where each class puts on a cultural presentation and they make food from their country. So French class presents French food. It's really quite a social event more than anything, but there's nothing wrong with that if it keeps you engaged in the language, of course. Only problem is nobody's actually there forcing you to speak French or Mandarin. So the Defence Force uses cutting edge language learning tools for translation, but is that enough by itself? No, of course it isn't. Humans are the empathy link between culture and always will be. If you're a soldier, that means you need to learn about the language and culture of the exact regions and places and areas that you'll be operating in because it improves tactical decision making. Okay, so the army is good at this. They give a lot more money to this service and conduct their own intensive immersion training overseas, like at this language school in Cairo. But for those staying closer to home, they're certainly getting it right on those neighboring islands we've been speaking about. We're 
able to bring on approximately 250 pallets of disaster relief stores. Let's say you want to just practice your skills online for a little bit. Well, what can you do in the Defence Force? Well, there is a defence learning site called ADELE, -E, or Australian Defence Education Learning Environment, which has a skills maintenance package for languages. You can do exercises and tests from previous refresher courses. And if you're being deployed overseas, you can get your family as well to learn the language too. They have courses for this. Admittedly, very short courses, but courses that are available nonetheless, which is great. And don't you ever forget. Important question time. What proficiency level do these guys reach over the year, do you think? How well can they actually speak? Well, I believe the graduation standard is intermediate level. So to pass, you have to score a two plus in the one to four scale that I mentioned earlier. As an example of what this means, if you score a two plus for speaking on the general language course, this is what it says uh, in the proficiency scale. It says generally effective. The speaker is able to convey meaning on a range of general and specialist topics. How about that standard then? I think I'll leave you to make up your own mind. Either way, if you pass, congratulations, but you can't wait to use your new language. As soon as they have specialised, sailors usually begin by practising their skills at shore-based facilities before posting to sea. But most members are placed on a list of qualified linguists, and then well, they wait. How do opportunities come your way? Well, that depends on what is going on in the world. But as soon as an operation comes up that requires specific linguists, the language manager will send out emails to the group who speak the language that they need. Thai linguists, Vietnamese linguists, and if that is you, then you're in luck. It's time to do the job for real. But if your number hasn't come up, well just hang in there. Rumour has it that there is a great reason for you to keep working on your language. They also offer Skype meetings every week, and these are language sessions run by the same State Department that diplomats go through. And there's another contract with an external language school as well, although this is all completely optional. So after all of this, what about the money. I know you want to know, and here it is. Different languages pay at different rates, believe it or not. There is a sliding scale depending on the language and your skill level, as you can see here. You might not even receive pay, but if you don't use it in your job, you think about it like this. The whole time you're studying and not doing forced push-ups, you're receiving your full salary just to learn languages, which is pretty cool. Well, if you want to see exactly how to force people to study their language, well, you need to watch this video here about the mad or totally insane methods of the French Foreign Legion.